Welcome, everyone, to the VBC Bible Institute and podcast, and welcome back to our course, A Journey Through the Bible. Now, I know we're still in Genesis chapter 6. I know that. And I know that you're probably thinking, at this rate, we're never going to finish this. And I I apologize. I, I, I've talked about this before. There's a part of me that feels horrible. Like, I, I feel like, man, I should just... I should be doing far more here and we should be moving quicker. But then there's another part of me that's like, no, I'm, I'm going, I'm going as fast as I, as I think that I can. Maybe, maybe I could do more. I know I, if I did not do so many other podcasts, maybe I could do more episodes, but I hope you're, you're benefiting from this. I know I've, I've handed out some very um, big assignments for people to turn to, to to turn in to tune in to turn in to me. So if you've completed those assignments, please email them to me at newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com, and I will take a look at what you have accomplished. If you are still following along, still listening, still working on things, still reading, hey, please communicate with me. Let me know what you need, what you want me to study, what questions you may have, anything I can do. I mean, we we did a, uh, what, two parts on cross-referencing. I think we did two messages, two lessons on cross-referencing, all because a student asked the question. So you're really driving us through this journey through the Bible, but we're, we've, we've going to take... We're going to take kind of a detour and some of this is going, uh, some of this is going to be kind of placed on you to do a little work. Maybe we will see. Now, typically I can go an hour easy. I really can't go an hour uh, because I'm supposed to be back live on the air for the Sunday evening uh, church service. So (laughs) I I have, I have so much to do and and so little time to do it. I I so many things to talk about. I did an interesting uh, episode on uh, billionaires uh, trying to find ways to live forever. Um, you, you, you can go listen to that if you want. That's on the Theology Central podcast. But uh, today we have, we have, I think, something important here to discuss. Are you ready? Now, book of Genesis. One of the key elements, one of the key features uh, uh, to the book of Genesis, one of the key things to remind, to, to be conscious of every time you read it, is that obviously, The book of Genesis is the first book we encounter, the first book we read when we open our Bibles, right? We open it, there it is. And we believe a fundamental tenet of, a fundamental teaching of Christianity, a fundamental doctrine of Christianity is that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So the whole Bible is inspired. God is the ultimate author. Human beings took, you know, they wrote it down, but God is the one who ultimately inspired it and it's his word. All right. So we read Genesis and we know that Genesis is then introduces us to ultimately the rest of the Bible. And in many cases, it lays down very important theological principles and theological truths that are going to be critical to understanding other parts of the Bible. They're like, you get to Romans, there's parts of Romans you can't understand without knowing what happened to Adam and Eve. There are certain things in the Bible you cannot understand correctly unless you understand Genesis. So Genesis is very key in understanding all of that. And I want you to keep that in mind because what we're going to do today is I'm going to, we're going to jump way ahead. We're going to jump way ahead and we're going to go to the book of Ezekiel. And I'm going to make kind of an argument that Genesis could possibly lay down a hermeneutical foundation a a hermeneutical direction that if we take that direction and follow kind of the lead that we, we, we come across in Genesis, it will greatly impact how we handle a very difficult and very controversial section in the book of Ezekiel. And I'm talking about the last eight chapters to the book of Ezekiel. All right. So let's, let's leave Genesis Let's jump to Ezekiel, all right? I know this is not the way you would typically do it in a Bible college or a seminary, but remember, Bible colleges and seminaries are limited by time, so they have to move quickly. We're not limited by that. So if we want to take this detour, I think it's beneficial for you. If you care about reading the Bible, studying the Bible, and understanding and interpreting the Bible, and that's the goal of this Bible Institute, to take you to a, a journey through the entire Bible and give you the tools and how to study it for yourself, then I think this is worth the time. All right. When you get to Ezekiel chapter 40, Ezekiel chapter 40, uh, 
from Ezekiel chapter 40 to Ezekiel chapter 48, you have eight chapters that's, that's really, it's filled with details that you may not even understand why they're there. And they're filled with a lot of details about a temple. It gives all these measurements. Let me just give you an example. Um, Ezekiel chapter 40, verse 5, And behold, a wall on the outside of the house, round about, and in the man's hand, a measuring reed of six cubits long by the cubit, and hand breadth. So he measured the breadth of the building, one reed, and the height, one reed. And he starts talking about the gate, the chamber, and they're measuring this, measuring that. And they give you all of these very precise details and measurements and and descriptions of this and that. And you've got eight chapters, really, of this kind of content. Eight chapters of it. But even though it's so detailed, even though it's so specific, there are many throughout church history who says Ezekiel 40, chapter 40 through uh, to chapter 48, it is not to be viewed literally. That's not a literal temple. Let me give you an example. A very cl- famous classic commentary by Matthew Henry. Matthew Henry's commentary on Ezekiel. Now you have the concise commentary and then the complete uh, commentary. I'm reading, the Ma- I'm reading from the Matthew Henry complete commentary, not the concise one, but the complete one. And note what uh, he states here. This is Matthew Henry writing in his commentary. As Dr. Lightfoot observes... That these things, speaking of Ezekiel 40 through 48, that these things cannot be literally, but must, but must spiritually understood. So these things cannot be literally understood. They have to be spiritually understood. And then listen to these words. At the gospel temple erected by Christ and his apostles was so closely connected with the second material temple was erected so carefully just at the time when that fell into decay, that I might be ready to receive the glories when it resigned them, that it was proper enough that they should both be referred to in one and the same vision under the type and figure of a temple and altar, priest, and sacrifices is for shown the spiritual worship that should be performed in gospel times, more agreeable to the nature both of God and man, and that perfected and last in the kingdom of glory, in which perhaps these visions will have their full accomplishment. And some think in some happy and glorious state of the gospel church on this side of heaven and the latter days. So this is somehow a spiritual temple, a spiritual temple somehow brought about about Christ and what, what words by Christ and his apostles. And that this could possibly have the, uh, some happy and glorious state of the gospel church on this side of heaven. So somehow the gospel church, somehow this temple represents the gospel church or the, or the spiritual temple built by Christ and his apostles. So eight chapters with all of these details, all of these measurements, but it's not literal. You cannot literally understand it. You can understand it, only understand it spiritually. Now, well, when we get to Ezekiel in what, 30 years from now, when we ever get there, we will have to answer that question and try to struggle with it. And I want to make it very clear. It may not be as easy as just saying, hey, it's literal. It may not be as easy as just saying, hey, it's spiritual. It's probably going to be far more complicated than that, as most things are in the Bible. They require far more thought. There's many layers. You have to really think. You have to really put on your thinking caps. And you have to be willing Sadly, you've got to realize this. You can't just interpret the Bible through the lens of your team. Like your team may say, hey, this is the way you do it, but we're not, we're not on a team. Like I don't care how the independent fundamental Baptists do it. I don't care how the Reformed people do it. I don't care how the evangelical, I, I don't care. Like it's, it's about finding truth, not, not, oh, if I say this, I'm going to make everyone mad on my, on my team. I don't, my team is truth. That's, I'm on team truth. I'm not on team independent fundamental Baptist. I'm not on team anything. I'm on team truth. And I know that that offends some people, but, and, and that's why probably I'm never accepted by anyone, but I, I you know, I, I, I hate that. Like, okay, th- this is typically the way it works. And this is very important for everyone to understand. When you go to a Bible college or you go to a seminary, you go and you're being given that team's perspective. Like your, your seminary is either going to be an independent fundamental Baptist seminary, an evangelical seminary, a Lutheran seminary, a Reformed seminary, and they're going to give you that team's perspective. 
And so you kind of come, you go in and you come out and you're like, okay, that's the way it is. That's what I learned in seminary. And then you go and you preach that side's perspective and interpretation. But I, 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 I can't live that way, right? I'm willing to, like, okay, well, that's how some say it, but some see it this way. Wait, what about this? I want to understand all the different perspectives and try to figure it out. And, and, and not just that, I don't want, I'm not here to try to give you a side. I'm trying to here to give you tools so that you can engage the scriptures on your own, at your, on your own, at your own level. This is a very important concept uh, to me, all right? So let's do this, all right? So according to many, Ezekiel 40 through 48, Hey, that's spiritual. That's not a literal temple. It's not a literal temple. It's not going to be literally built. It's being, it, was, it started being spiritually built with Christ and the apostles. Maybe it somehow relates to the church. And Matthew Henry does this a lot with Isaiah and Ezekiel. It'll be time and time again, it'll be describing something like, no, 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 no. That's not Israel. That's not physical land. That's the church. That's the church's power, the church's influence. That's the spread of the gospel. It's not, no, no, no. It's not and you're like, whoa, how did we spiritualize all of this? Now, maybe there are reasons to do so, but I think Genesis is where we start looking for some clues, right? I think we start looking for some clues. So if you start reading in Genesis, so far up to Genesis 6, we've read, now we read about, uh, uh, you know, some individuals, we have, you know, some of the, the, uh, genealogy listed there that we've looked at, but some of the major individuals that are mentioned are obviously Adam and Eve, right? And I think that anyone who reads the New Testament can agree that Adam is treated as a literal person. Adam and Eve are treated as literal people who literally lived and literally did certain things. I think, I think you can agree with that. It's Adam who's viewed as the one who brought sin and death into the world. So that seems to speak of him as a literal person. I, th- I think I don't think you can get around that. There's no way that the New Testament, the New Testament does not treat Adam and Eve um, as figurative, allegorical individuals to teach something about God. No, it seems to speak of literal people who who did who who carried out literal actions who that had literal consequences upon the rest of creation. I think that that's fair to say. Um, I think Cain and Abel are spoken of as literal people who literally lived and. There was a literal murder that took place. I think the New Testament would carry that out. There are other people mentioned in Genesis that the New Testament seems to speak of as literal people. I think we can agree with that. And then we turn to Genesis 6, and we have the story of Noah. Now, clearly, we've already looked at that. The New Testament speaks of Noah. In the days of Noah, this is how things were going. Noah was a literal person. It speaks of getting into the ark and the flood as being a literal event. All of that spoken of as so so clearly, early on, the New Testament clearly gives us a, a, an interpretation of Genesis, and the interpretation is literal people, literal events, literal actions. Therefore, we are to interpret it literally. That's there's no way to get around. You can't say, well, this part's figurative, this part's literal. The, the New Testament writers, when they reference Genesis and in, in time after time, it's in a literal thing. What you should do, and this is this is kind of a just an extra credit assignment. Start in Genesis 1, Adam, look for New Testament verses that speak of Adam and look at them as, does it describe it as literal or figurative? Do the same, and I think I may have already given you some some work to do similar to this, but do that with uh, just from Genesis 1 to Genesis 6. Look for people who are mentioned and they'll look for New Testament verses and then read those New Testament verses and just write down. They treat them as a literal person who did who who was involved in a literal event and a literal action. Just just do that. We know Abraham's going to be treated as a liberal a literal person, right? We, we know Isaac is. We, we know all of the I mean, after you get past Genesis 1 through 11, starting in Genesis 12 and following, everything's treated, like those people are treated as, like everyone treats it as a historical narrative of literal people involved in literal actions. Just sometimes people want to want to allegorize and make it figurative and symbolic in Genesis 1 through 11 because it raises questions that, do, that things don't work out with modern science. And I can understand that, but that we've got to allow the text to drive how, how we go. The New Testament offers that interpretation. But here's something interesting that happens in Genesis 6. Just note this. Genesis chapter 6. All right? We've worked on all the difficulties. We've tried to expl- figure out a lot of these things. But something interesting happens in Genesis chapter 6 that I think is, is interesting. 
Okay. I'm, I'm losing uh, uh, pencils. I'm dropping things. Genesis chapter 6. And here, and here we have in Genesis chapter 6, verse 13. And God uh, said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence uh, through them. And behold, I will destroy them with, uh, I will destroy them with the earth. And here's Genesis 6, verse 14. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms uh, shall thou make in the ark and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. And a window uh, shall thou make uh, to the ark, and in a cubit shall thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shall thou set in the side thereof, with the lower second, third stories shall thou make it. Now, here's a story where there is something to be built, and it gives some details about it, some measurements and some details about it. All right. Now, this is one of the early accounts in Genesis that we have of something being built and it's given actual description. Now, we understand that, especially if we go to the New Testament and how obviously Noah is spoken of as a historical thing. The flood is spoken of as a historical thing. So that means that the first time we have something being described with measurements being built is something that we understand to be literal not allegorical, not spiritual, not figurative, but a literal bu- a little ark being built with literal measurements being given. Now we can understand how to uh, how do we you know how long is that measurement un- 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 based off the way we calculate measurements? We can we can try to figure that out, but it, it's it's right there. And in and in Genesis treats Noah as a literal person with literal things that happened, and there was a literal ark and a literal flood. That's the way the New Testament interprets it. Can't get around that. Now, if you go from Genesis and you jump from uh, Genesis over to the book of Exodus, you have the same thing that begins to happen. The book of Exodus, starting in chapter 25, Exodus chapter 25, Exodus chapter 26 and following, we have now the instructions to build something else. This time, not an ark, but to build a tabernacle. And uh, all kinds of things are discussed here. Um, you have, uh, I'll just give you an example, Exodus chapter 25, verse 16, and thou shalt put uh, into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee, and thou shalt make a mercy seat, pure gold, two cubits and a half, shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And then it begins, to, it continues. And you see this happening uh, through uh, chapter 25, uh, chapter 26, you have uh, the length of the one curtain. This is chapter 26, verse 2. The length of the one curtain shall be eight and 20 cubits, and the breadth of one curtain, four cubits, and every one of the curtains shall have one measure. We understand that to be literal measurements with a literal tabernacle. No one qu- uh, questions the tabernacle as not being real, and the New Testament treats the tabernacle as being a real tent that it was literal. So, Genesis gives us an early account of something being built and gives us measurements, and we understand it to be literal. Exodus does the same thing. And then if we jump, let's see, where would it be here? Um, If we jump, where do we want to go here with this? Um, If we go to... uh, Yes, if we go to 1 Kings chapter 7, I think this is a good place to go. 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 1, but Solomon was building his own house 13 years and he finished all his house. He, beat, he built also the house of the forest of, he built also the house of the forest of Lebanon. The length thereof was 100 cubits and the breadth there, uh, thereof 50 cubits and the height thereof uh, 30 cubits upon four rows of cedar pillars with cedar beams uh, upon the pillars. And he covered with cedar, and it talks about the building here. And if we go on, um, and then uh, it talks all about the building here, everything that's being built, and then it's going to get into a a big description of the building of the, uh, the temple. Well, guess what? The ark gives measurements and details, and guess what happens? It's a literal ark, literal person, literal event. We have a description of measurements and specifics about a tent being built called the tabernacle. We believe that to be literal. Moses, a literal person, literal tent, literal 
literal uh, things happen there. And we understand that again in light of the New Testament and the way it makes reference to it. Then we get to the temple being built. And clearly everyone interprets that temple Solomon built as being a literal temple with literal people inside of it that's literally destroyed. All literal, 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 literal. Measurements, everything is understood to be in a literal way. Then all of a sudden we get to Ezekiel and it's like, nope, stop, throw it out. Now, I listen, I understand there's different literary genres. I understand there's different literary genres. And I understand that there, we, but here's the thing. What we would have to do is find something specific in the text that would demand that we don't interpret it literally. And then if we find something in the text that demands that we don't interpret it literally, the text then would have to provide us something to give us a correct interpretation of it. Like, you can't just say, don't interpret it literally, and here's what it means spiritually. Well, how do you know it means that spiritually? Well, it's just what we know. It, it means Christ and the apostles building a gospel temple. What? what? It, it somehow references the church. We, what? Hey, and, and this, and this is very important. In Ezekiel, this is very important. When you get to the book of Revelation, oh, no, 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 don't, don't, take, don't take that literal, don't take that literal, don't take that literal. Well, wait a minute. I understand apocalyptic literature. I understand prophetic words. Sometimes you have to take it in a different way, but you have to have some explanation and how to understand it and how to interpret it. I think Genesis 6, with describing the building of the ark, is giving us at least a hermeneutical clue that whenever the Bible describes building something and gives all kinds of measurements, that it's a very good indication that we do so literally. Again, we do so in Genesis 6. The Tower of Babel, does it give, how much, uh, in Genesis 11, does it give, I mean, how many, I don't know if it gives a lot of details, and I don't think it gives many measurements. Let me see here. Genesis 11, there's Genesis 10, Genesis 11, um, yeah, it doesn't offer uh, any measurements. It just says, uh, and they said one to another, go to us, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime and they had for mortar. And they said, go, let us build a, a, us a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven. But everyone treats that literally. It doesn't even actually give measurements, but everyone treats it literally. Well, why don't we say it's not actually a temple? It wasn't actually a tower. This is just them. Uh, this is symbolic of them erecting a false religion. It has nothing to do with the a tower. They didn't build an actual tower. It's, it's a symbolic tower of a false religion. Nobody does that. But then we get to the temple in Ezekiel. No, that's not a real temple. That's not a literal. No, that's not a literal temple. When when it talks about Israel and land, well, that's not really Israel. That's spiritual Israel. That's the church. That land, that's not literal land. That's that's just spiritual influence. And this, a lot of people are going to use that way of thinking. Now, listen, listen. I am more than willing to change my mind at any point in time. Is if when we get to those sections, we find that all I'm trying to say is allow Genesis to uh, provide you a hermeneutical roadmap. It's giving you the clues on how to interpret things, right? And, and here's the best way to be able to prove that your interpretation is right. If Genesis mentions something, go to the New Testament and see how the authors treat it. Do they treat it as an allegory, as not real people, as not a literal event, or do they treat it as real people, literal events with real consequences? If they do, then you're on the right track. Because now, you, who are you going to argue with? You know, who are you going to argue with? You know, who are, or not who you're going to argue with, who are you going to agree with, right? Or I guess who you can argue with. You can state it either way. Are you going to argue with, I don't know, the Apostle Paul, uh, the Gospel writers, the New Testament writers? Or are you going to argue with a professor in a seminary? I think I'm going to argue with a professor in a seminary and not the writers in the New Testament. Who am I going to agree with, a, a, a professor in a seminary or with the writers of the New Testament? If the writers in the New Testament treat it as literal, then I have to treat it as literal. It's not even about my opinion anymore. It's not about even what I want anymore. So over and over, Genesis, just constantly, and you can, you can just do this. If, 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 you've, if you've worked this out, great. If you haven't done any detailed work on it, then this is the time to do that detailed work. Even if you've done it, you may want to do it again. You want to have this down. So for example, Adam, find me a New Testament passage that 
speaks of Adam and then tell me, how does the New Testament writer handle it? You look at it for yourself. Don't trust me. You look at it for yourself. Does the New Testament writer treat Adam as a real person who did real things with real consequences? Cain and Abel, real people, real consequences, real actions. Did they treat them literally or figuratively? Noah, literal or figurative? I think you're going to find immediately Adam. I think you're going to see uh, Enoch. Uh, you just go through Genesis. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, over and over, literal people, literal events, treated as literal events with real consequences. Genesis 6 describes the building of the ark, giving you actual measurements. Well, don't we treat that as literal? But why do we get to something like Ezekiel 40 and go, measurements, details, not literal, not literal, spiritual. When it describes Israel and land, nope, not literal promises, not literal Israel, all figurative, all related to the church. You've got, you've got to figure out where, where your hermeneutical principles change and what bases that change. What, what are you basing it on? So just something to think about. I wanted to at least throw this out there. Um, I don't know what we're going to do. Here, here's, here's how I think we're going to approach it. All right. Um, I, um, I'm going to allow you, what we'll do the next time we're together, we'll listen to Genesis 6 and 7 being read, and then I think we may move to Genesis chapter 8. If there's something in Genesis chapter 7 you have a question on, this is the time to ask, but I think we're going to kind of, I think we've, we've, we've really, I think we're going to skip a little bit, and then we'll get into, um, we also, you see, we got Genesis Yeah, and, and Genesis 8, we don't really have a lot going on there. Genesis 9, we have some very important things. Uh, Genesis 10, we have, um, we'll look for some things. I mean, you have a big genealogy uh, happening here. Um, and then we get to Genesis 11, and then we, uh, we have the Tower of Babel, okay? Then we finally get to Genesis 12. So uh, I'll leave, a lot of that, I'll leave it up to you. Any questions you have about Genesis 7, 8, and 9, um, and 10, Genesis 8, 9, and 10. Any questions you have, you're, the students are going to get to kind of drive what we cover. Genesis 7, 8, 9, and 10. It's up to you. What in it do you have questions about? What do you struggle with? Let me know, and then that will drive what, how we uh, work. We may move through Genesis 7, 8, 9, and 10 relatively quick, spend a little time in 11, and then jump quickly over to 12, um, and then we'll start a study and following the life of Abraham. All right, so... I think that's where we're going to go. But I wanted to at least throw this out there as kind of a hermeneutical lesson. And I just think Genesis starts laying down the foundation. It's, it's giving us a roadmap. Literal people, literal events, literal measurements, literal object. Exodus follows the same trend, follows the same trend when the temple's being built. But all of a sudden, by the time we get to Ezekiel and parts of Isaiah, people are like, nope, throw all, all the literal, let's go spiritual. And it's like, when did it change? All right. So I'll stop right there. You can email me at newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. That's newsif at yahoo.com. All right, I'll stop right there. Everyone have a great day. God bless.